All right, hello everyone. This is Jess Unger here. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. This is, of course, the first in your eight-part series to complement the in-person training for the Texas Heritage Response Team. These programs are made possible through the generous grant funding support of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. We're kicking off this webinar series with three programs that take a broader approach to the topic of disaster response. Just going to pull over for you all here a reminder of the overview of our webinar schedule. Today's program, of course, is on the psychology of disaster situations. We'll be holding our next session on March 7th regarding health and safety, and then we'll be holding another session on March 21st about funding sources for cultural institutions affected by disasters. From there, we'll move into programs that address material-specific salvage considerations. Photos on electronic media, textiles, wooden and upholstered furniture, paintings, and book and paper objects. We'll wrap the final program on May 23rd, which will be just about one month before our final in-person meeting and disaster scenario training. If you miss any webinar sessions, I'll email you with a recording of the program. Write to me when you finish with the recording, and then I'll note your attendance. You will be expected to complete all webinars before we meet again on June 21st. Before we begin today's presentation, I wanted to share some brief technical notes. On your screen, you'll see several boxes, including one labeled chat on the left-hand side. You can use this chat box to say hello, ask questions, share any information or links that you'd like. Links will be live, so all attendees can click directly on them. If you post a question in the chat box, you'll receive a response from me. Any questions will be noted, collected, and then I will verbally ask them of our presenter when she completes her remarks. You'll also see a box at the bottom of the screen titled Web Links. Simply click, click on one of these links to highlight it in blue, and then click the Browse To button at the bottom of the window in order to open that page. And with that, I'm very pleased to introduce you all to today's presenter, Dr. Jody Hortzman. Dr. Hortzman is a PhD, HSPP, and a licensed psychologist. She has 28 years of experience in community mental health, serving youths, adults, and families. In her current role at Aspire Indiana, she serves as Chief Clinical Officer. Prior to that, she served as Senior Director of Comprehensive Outpatient Services and Senior Director of Youth and Family Community Services. Since 2005, Dr. Horstman has taught courses on psychological first aid with the state of Indiana. She has been involved with multiple disaster mental health responses, both nationally and internationally. She served with the American Red Cross in New York following September 11th, as part of the Indiana Task Force that assisted Mississippi following Hurricane Katrina and worked in Haiti following the 2010 earthquake. She is a member of Indiana's State Disaster Mental Health Team and a trainer of Psychological First Aid, PFA. Dr. Horseman received her Bachelor of Arts degree in Behavioral Science from California State Polytechnic University and her Master of Arts and Doctoral degrees in Clinical Psychology from the United States International University in San Diego, California. Dr. Horseman was involved with training the team of National Heritage Responders on the topic of the psychology of disaster situations, so we're incredibly fortunate to be joined by her today. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Horseman. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, I really appreciate the introduction, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today. Looks like we have quite a few participants, so that's, that's exciting. Um, I always welcome the opportunity to talk about this, so this is, uh, this is not my day job. Uh, I work at a community mental health center, but this is truly my passion, uh, is disaster response. So um, thank you again for, for uh, letting me participate in this. So I am going to drive the uh, presentation today. Uh, I do want to note that uh, I have included some photos in here. I know it's very dry to sit and watch a webinar and hear someone talk and not be able to look at things. So I'm going to try to punctuate this with some photos and some uh, stories along the way. So let's talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about disasters in general and then um, the impact or consequences of those disasters. The focus of today um, is going to be providing some background information related to that, some general understanding of 
uh, those that impact and those consequences, uh, understanding some of the, the special needs of uh, certain populations, and then um, what are the needs of, of the survivors and responders? And then we're going to move into uh, psychological first aid and a little bit about self-care. So let us begin. All right, so I'm going to start um, with a slide that may seem odd to start with, but it's really about resilience. Uh, because resilience is really important here and is often underestimated. Uh, so when we hear about a disaster or a traumatic event um, or you know widespread impact of, of something negative, um, oftentimes we are led to believe that um, that this uh, is an absolutely devastating event that everyone is um, severely negatively impacted. I'm going to talk a little bit about why we're we're led to believe that. But what is often not noted um, and isn't, um, I guess, maybe felt to be attention worthy is that really resilience or that ability to, to bounce back, to maintain a stable equilibrium, um, or to better cope with things, uh, negative events in the future is really more common than we believe. Now, um, I'm a psychologist, and so the second uh, point here. Uh, has been true for me as well. So mental health workers, um, we typically often don't appreciate that. And actually in the past decade or so, this has been a, a focus that's been pointed out to us um, is to recognize people's strengths and to not make assumptions that because something negative um, occurred that people are going to automatically say uh, develop post-traumatic stress disorder. It's actually much more common uh, in both children and adults for people to respond in a resilient manner. And we think of resilience often as something that is kind of innate to someone. Like you may say, oh yeah, he or she is just a very resilient person. Uh, but really, only 20 to 30 percent of our resilience has to do with um, our genetic or biological makeup. Uh, it's certainly impacted some by our early upbringing and, and uh, exposure. But by far, Resilience is uh, mostly related to a series of skills that can be developed at any point in our lifetime. And some people have done a, a really good job at developing those skills. Um, others have some great opportunities to develop those skills. But the great news is that we, any of us can do that at any time. So I have a uh, statistic on here. It's fairly old. Uh, that 50 to 60 percent of the US population is exposed to traumatic stress. I recently actually just read another one that, that says uh, really about 85% of adults in the U.S. have been exposed to some type of traumatic event. Uh, but the bottom statistic remains the same, that really only about 5 to 10% develop post-traumatic stress disorder. We as a country have been very sensitized to that diagnosis um, due to military conflicts and our um, armed forces coming back home, and that's certainly not to minimize uh, that some, some individuals may be experiencing that. Um, but because of those conversations, we often jump to the conclusion that um, any exposure to traumatic stress will automatically lead to um, some serious um, consequences or potentially a diagnosis, and that simply is just not true. Okay, so let's talk. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to go back a little bit here. Um, and do. Yeah, oh, we'll stick with this. Okay, so consequences of critical events um, often include loss. And that by itself makes sense, right? But what we don't often anticipate is that those uh, those losses are really beyond what we would imagine at any given point in time. So, for example, we may say, well, if if a disaster occurred, uh, so here I am in Indiana. If a tornado came through, um, then and and I lost my home, then I would be able to access these resources, or I would be able to. Um, 
um, be able to stay in a hotel or I would be able to um, still go out to a restaurant. And, and oftentimes we just really don't anticipate all the different um, ways that, that, an impact, that a disaster may impact us. So uh, I'm going to go through some of those. Uh, the important thing here is that um, every day we function with a level of denial and it's a very healthy level of denial. So for example, we wouldn't get in our cars and drive if we were very focused every day in terms of what the risk is or what the statistics say uh, in terms of our risk of being in an accident or uh, being in injured or being killed. So in actuality, we kind of put that out of our mind, right? Uh, same thing when we get in an airplane. So we take those risks and we set those aside so that we can function on a day-to-day -day basis. And what happens in a disaster is that, that that is stripped away from us, that sense of safety and security um, that we base our everyday lives on drastically and abruptly gets stripped away from us, uh, leaving us questioning a lot of things and um, feeling very vulnerable to a lot of things. So these critical losses that we may experience uh, could include our loved ones, um, certainly uh, material goods, so in, you know the things that we own, but also some real um, systemic or community um, type resources, so our employment. Uh, most often people don't think of the impact of a disaster as I may lose my job or my employer may no, may no longer be functioning in that community. Um, and again, that trust in the future. So I'm going to show you some photos um, from Katrina. Um, so uh, to illustrate this point, so here's a photo of a church in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina down in uh, Gulfport and Biloxi. And so when you think about where do people go when they feel like they've had critical losses or they feel um, like they're lost or questioning, where are those, those sources of support that we would traditionally and habitually turn to? And certainly our, our, our religious faith, our spiritual connections, that sense of community through our faith organizations it is one of those that's frequently turned to and may no longer be there. Uh, when we were um, deployed to uh, Biloxi, this was a Comfort Suites motel that was uh, very close to us. And again, back to a previous comment, so your home is flooded or um, destroyed in a fire and you are um, assuming that you, you'll have another place to stay. Well, as we know, when there is widespread flooding or devastation, that that may not, may not really be an option, but we don't really think about that um, at the time. We also typically don't think about how we're going to get around. Uh, we make assumptions that I'll be able to drive to Walmart um, or I will be able to uh, get to the bank. Um, I will be able to exit this area and go somewhere else. And the reality is that we may not have access to that transportation. And again, on a day-to-day -day basis, that's not something that we even consider. This was a Winn-Dixie. Um, when I was uh, down in Mississippi, um, this was probably one of the biggest surprises that we as responders um, faced is that we got there and there was nothing. There was literally nothing. Um, there was no access to getting material goods. There was uh, no electricity. There were no cell phones. The water was contaminated. Um, people had been faced with this. Uh, the, the people that reside there have been faced, had been faced with that for some time. Um, but that infrastructure was not there. And uh, we base our day-to-day -day assumptions, again, on that. Another um, Another piece of infrastructure that I like to bring up that I, that I learned about while I was there was banks. So I'm going to encourage everyone to, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, in preparation for the unexpected, uh, is to carry out what we call a flying 40. 
and uh, a 4040 is that you have some cash, $40, $20, or whatever that you keep in your car or a safe place, um, or some amount of uh, money in small bills. Because what we saw there, and um, I'm sure also impacted areas with widespread uh, flooding, was that banks were not open. Uh, there was no electricity. And when they did open, uh, they had limited cash. And so we would see long lines of folks that were waiting for $20 because that's all that there was a certain amount of $20 bills that were going to be passed out from the bank that day. So even when Walmart, which is traditionally the first store that does open after a disaster, I have to give them a lot of credit. They have, um, they have quite a plan and uh, procedure to getting, uh, getting goods into a disaster area. So even when things did open, people did not have money. Uh, to be able to purchase things. And of course, one of the, the other um, great impacts in, in a flood or a hurricane um, are in, impact to rituals. So um, some of those are related to cemeteries. So one of the things that occurred there was um, cemeteries were flooded, um, remains were swept away, they were mixed up, they were um, lost, and there's a, a, some real critical loss that's also felt with that. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit uh, more about some definitions. So we talked about um, resilience to begin with, and now let's talk about a crisis. So uh, here you have one um, definition of a crisis, events or situation perceived as intolerably difficult that exceed an individual's available resources and coping mechanisms. Um, and I, so what I, what I want to point out to you and why I have this slide on here and why I'm going to differentiate this from uh, trauma or disaster is a uh, crisis is very unique. And we, uh, us human beings, can tend to um, be a little judgmental sometimes. So sometimes we will people who will be experiencing something and we'll in our minds say to ourselves I just don't understand why this is a crisis it doesn't see it wouldn't be a crisis to me so uh, but it's also very important because as you are interacting with folks you don't know you don't know what um, what stress they brought to the table what burdens they were already carrying before um, this particular event occurred. So for example, if I uh, am already going through a divorce and maybe I'm losing custody of my child or I've lost my job or my home is on, in foreclosure and then this occurred, uh, it's almost as if I'm already at simmer and it's not going to take a lot of stress to bring me to boil. So a small event may be perceived as a crisis to me at that point in time just because I am so strapped for resources. Um, and feeling unable to cope with what's occurring at that time. So uh, my message here is be compassionate, but also be aware, where are you uh, in terms of your stress level uh, when you're asked to respond or deploy to uh, an area? What, what resources do you have available to the table uh, to bring to the table and how will that impact you? Um, I also wanna talk about um, a disaster. So a disaster is a sudden calamitous event that ser seriously disrupts the functioning of a community or society and causes human, material, and economic or environmental losses that exceed the community's or society's ability to cope using its own resources. So that definition, you can tell, um, is much broader, much more impactful in terms of uh, its impact but many of the same uh, concepts here in that a community or a society's uh, available resources are inadequate to cope and they feel overwhelmed. I also want to briefly talk about uh, a couple other terms. So we use a term survivor. Um, we don't tend to use the term victim uh, because that, that has a negative connot connotation and survivor is an individual who's been directly impacted by the event. So what I really wanna point out to you is that uh, a responder, 
a responder who um, goes to that situation, who participates, who um, is assisting in that situation by definition, even though they are there to help or support, because they are there, they in essence are also a survivor. So a lot of the things that we talk about as we move forward, um, I want you to think about in terms of, okay, so there's individuals that were directly impacted when it occurred, but by virtue of being there and participating and assisting, you also are subject to many of these same types of um, issues or concerns. And then there's trauma. And trauma is uh, not an event. Trauma is actually a process. And um, this is where the psychological first aid will come in later as we're talking about um, the impact of trauma. It is very unique, again, to the individual. It's the individual's perception of the event. Um, it is not an objective uh, definition. It, is, uh, it resides actually in the nervous system and in the body. So uh, the bottom portion of the slide, it happens uh, when an event stuns, like a bolt out of the blue, overwhelms the individual and leaves us altered and disconnected from our bodies. And what that basically means is that the, the suddenness, the stripping away of that sense of safety, uh, and the resulting thinking and emotions that go along with that um, really impact us on a biological level. So we say trauma resides in the body as opposed to that it's a cognitive or emotional issue because we experience um, very strong emotions, very disconnected, um, sometimes um, disconcerting thinking that doesn't necessarily seem very logical and rational to us um, as a result and is worrisome. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So we, we can't understand it. We can't make sense of it. Uh, and that is part of what psychological first aid does is to help us kind of categorize that and tuck that away. So let's a little talk a little bit about the psychological consequences uh, of disaster. So let's talk first about psychological footprint. When uh, a disaster or broad spread uh, event occurs, what we typically hear about are um, deaths, um, injuries, and uh, economic losses. Um, what we don't typically hear about is psychological impact. And that may be because it's hard to define and uh, because there does remain stigma related to that. 9-11, I think, was a groundbreaker in terms of uh, allowing us to normalize people's reactions to abnormal situations, to be able to seek assistance um, or ask questions about what we're experiencing. And there's, uh, since that time, we really have a com come a long way. Uh, but it's usually responders that uh, are are more in tune with the psychological footprint. So this photo or this uh, picture here is basically a representation of um, the impact. So if you look at it, the small blue circle is the medical footprint of that disaster. So that would be the injuries or that would be the, the deaths. And then you see how small that is compared to the psychological footprint. So let me give you an example of this, a couple different examples. Um, so Let's say that um, a tornado comes through town and while school is in and knocks out cell, tow cell towers. Um, where, and, and schools are evacuated and, and people don't know where their children are. Where is it that they go? Where is it when we can't find someone we're concerned about and there's been some uh, devastation or some type of disaster event, where do we go? We go to the hospital. And so we call this the psychological surge of a hospital. This is where people will show up at the hospital looking for other people, will uh, ask, asking to have their questions answered. They, um, to use the clinical term, maybe freaking out, right? It's not really a clinical term. I put air quotes around that. Uh, but that's kind, of, that's kind of what we say, right? I mean, people are very concerned. They can be panicking um, and they're, they, they need attention. Um, and it's not unreasonable for them to, to feel that way. However, their psychological or emotional responses oftentimes do get in the way 
uh, when, when there is medical care that needs to be given or there is triage that's going on. So that's how a psychological footprint um, can immediately impact a situation and it also tends to be much more long-standing. Here's another example. <clears throat> if you think about <clears throat> after 2001, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to the anthrax scare, and you think about how many individuals were afraid um, or didn't want to touch their mail or, um, you know, were, were their anxiety peaked related to exposure to anthrax. And then how many direct casualties were there actually were? There were 22 direct casualties related to anthrax, <clears throat> yet it, it totally shut down our, our uh, postal service. And people were, um, again, very concerned, very freaked out, very um, reactive to any type of white powdery substance. Um, and so if you, that's a good example of medical to psychological ratio in terms of the impact. This is a picture um, from Haiti following the earthquake. <clears throat> and part of why this is here is to talk a little bit about infrastructure because again, the impact um, is widespread and oftentimes not uh, what we anticipate. So uh, because some disasters are very widespread and certainly the flooding from the hurricane, um, and if you think about the wildfires that have been occurring you know, that's a lot of territory, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of economy, and a lot of lives affected. And so we often think about, again, in that typical day-to-day, -day, living your life kind of thing, oh, yes, well, if this happened, I'll, I'll re rebuild my home, or I'll do this. And it may be that those resources aren't there. And uh, we're, we'll get a little into that a little bit about our expectations and how that impact us. Uh, but again, that sense of security, that sense of the way things should be, the way they ought to work, gets stripped away. Uh, again, in Haiti, so this is trash. This is garbage um, that, due to the devastation, had been simply piled into the middle of the road uh, and was rotting in the sun. And so you can imagine then the subsequent impact of that in terms of vermin, in terms of disease and exposure to that. Those umbrellas that you see in the background, let me use this fancy feature right here, back here, this is the food market that's going on. And so you can see that, um, that inability to put things to rest, to reset them, to get back to normal um, does not keep people from from attempting to do that, but continues to impact um, their ability to do that. Another thing I saw in Haiti was um, some medical records that had been washed away and um, were piled up and there was a, actually a goat eating them at the time. So uh, that didn't, didn't make us feel very good in terms of access to healthcare and records either. Uh, this is just a photo of um, one of the infamous tent cities that occurred. So again, not even resources to be able to um, reside safely and securely. And then this is uh, water, just access to water. And you know, we, we hear about this currently in Puerto Rico, about um, those basic needs that still, months and months after um, the hurricane, still have not been put back into place. and um, what what a devastating impact that must have for people who just thought, okay, as soon as this is over, I can rebuild my life. So let's talk about the phases of a disaster. Um, this slide came out of some research by Zunin and Myers, and, and subsequent research has really indicated that this is true for communities, agencies, and individuals. Uh, when we went to Haiti, it was true for Haiti. Um, so it really, there's not a cultural difference here as well. So let me um, walk you through this. Um, and I also want you to think about when you respond, when you go to a disaster area, at what point are you um, 
arriving because I know from working through the Red Cross that uh, and doing briefings from when people come back that at what time period or what phase that they're responding um, very much um, impacts the, the experience that they have because we all want to go help. Uh, and sometimes that's well received and, and sometimes we're faced with something else. So this is pre-disaster functioning. Okay, so this is basically a graph of functioning. So the community, the person, the agency is doing fairly well, fairly normal. This would be their normal state, right? And then we have um, a threat of disaster, if that is possible. Sometimes it's not. And then we have the actual impact. And so now you have the, the low point of functioning, right? Then comes this, what we call the heroic phase. And this is when people respond. This is when um, the country responds, when Salvation Army, Red Cross, uh, there's fundraising, there's groups coming to, um, to assist. People are helping re rebuild homes um, or clean out um, devastation. And there's some really heroic things. I think this is a, a adequately named uh, phase in that there are some really heroic things. Neighbors are rescuing neighbors and helping out. And you really do see um, some of the best in people as they come together and, and those day-to-day -day, um, details that, that typically take up our lives and stress us out are, are stripped away and we're refocused on things that we feel are really matter. Now, at some point, um, there's a honeymoon, right? So it, it tops out and then um, we have this decrease in functioning and you can see that this this actually falls below the level of functioning here so um, people are used to getting some help and, and feeling supported and encouraged and they start to believe that things are going to be all right and it will quickly return to quote normal and then they discover that there's another disaster or groups have to get back to um, their regular lives or jobs and they leave the focus um, is taken off and those resources that came in um, leave. And so people actually uh, and communities feel this sense of dis disillusionment um, that really, really is devastating. So this is an emotional devastation here that occurs following a physical devast devastation. If you are responding during this time, you will likely be greeted uh, as, uh, as saviors, helpful, um, very thankful, all right, respond during this time. This is a time where people are really angry uh, and sometimes they feel uh, that um, that the world or the community or the, the nation has, has left them behind or that they just don't care anymore and people tend to, to be more irritable and angry here. And then there's this really long extended and this says one to three years down here at the bottom and it really does extend beyond that, where uh, there's really a working through of grief and people uh, over a very long term then begin reconstructing their lives and their communities and developing what we call a new normal, right? Uh, and this is punctuated by times of anniversary re reactions or trigger events. So for example, another hurricane uh, is a potential threat or some flooding. Uh, there's smaller flooding in another area and people have some real emotional reactions to that legitimately. So uh, how are we directly impacted? Well, these are the people that typically are, are um, immediately impacted, right? So <clears throat> um, this it makes sense that our family members, our friends, our coworkers, um, people that are there with us are impacted. But it's kind of like that six degrees of separation, right? Because you can go further away, and so your family members that don't live there may be very concerned. Um, also, the exposure to the disaster is, um, is very telling here. So it gets back to that individual response. So the closer that a person is, to that event, um, then that exacerbates the impact of that. So if you are working in a community um, that you also live in that is impacted by a disaster, and so this occurred to me in response, uh, we had some flooding in 2008 here in Indiana, and my community was affected. And uh, so I was working 14 to 16 hours a day, 
uh, I was um, meeting with friends and neighbors and, and people I love that had been impacted. Uh, there's a whole nother emotional toll that um, is, is uh, present when you are working in your own community. Some of the mediating factors, things that might uh, mitigate that psychological distress is that you may have some prior experience with a similar event. Um, maybe you, uh, it's been a while since uh, the event has occurred. Those things are mediating factors. Uh, someone may have uh, some individual perceptions about that event that uh, causes them to maybe not be so impacted as they may have been. Okay, so everyone, everyone has, uh, is impacted by a disaster to some degree. Some of those reactions will cause enough distress to interfere with adaptive coping and recovery. And these are the broad categories related to that. Now I want to take a moment to just um, talk about neuroscience, which sounds complicated, but it's um, basically we're impacted by it every day. And the more we understand about the way our brains work, without getting into really uh, big detail, the, the easier it is for us to understand what's happening. So what happens um, unconsciously and unwillingly is that when we are, we are faced by a threat or a perceived threat, our attention is uh, basically hijacked by that perceived threat. And our bodies become uh, prepared for fight, flight, or freeze, right? So we have a flood of um, endorphins and uh, other and cortisol and, and stress hormone preparing us for that reaction, uh, for whatever we need to do. Uh, but what our brains do is it our brains narrow our attention to the perceived threat, which makes sense in an evolutionary aspect. It's much uh, safer to, to assume a threat is there and, and avoid it than to assume the threat is not there uh, and then be uh, fall victim to that, right? So um, our natural reaction, without us even realizing it, is we will we will fo begin focusing on things that we find stress uh, potential threats or potential stresses, and what that is doing is is also excluding our brain is automatically excluding uh, information that may mitigate that, that may uh, be positive information, it may be contradictory information. So all that, any of that potential positive information gets filtered out and we oftentimes don't even take that in. We lose our ability to problem solve and to be creative uh, because our, our brains have basically been hijacked to, to keep us safe. So um, I encourage you that when you are in an area where there is a disaster or even on a day-to-day -day basis, be aware of the fact that what you hear on the news or on the radio or, or whatever it is that you're reading, um, if we are convincing ourselves that we are always under threat, that is always how, that is always how we will respond. And um, that causes an ongoing stress. So let's talk a little bit about some of the um, some of the impact psychologically um, and behaviorally. So irritability and anger, self blame or blaming others, isolating ourselves from other folks or withdrawing, um, feeling stunned or overwhelmed or helpless, unexplained mood swings. So oftentimes people will feel like they um, have a surge of emotion that isn't necessarily rationally related to what it is that, that is going on at the moment. Uh, and that is a common reaction to, uh, to such a situation. Certainly sadness uh, and grief, problems concentrating, problems following simple instructions or uh, remembering things are really common. And so we make, take great care to be able to, um, to be very clear in our communication. Uh, relationship problems, marital discord uh, comes up quite frequent, frequently, excuse me. People will have uh, physical symptoms if they've had uh, an illness or, or um, they have some type of physical disorder, it is common that that suddenly kind of reemerges or can get worse. People will uh, can sometimes experience nightmares, 
uh, fatigue, inability to sleep or want to sleep all the time, uh, gastrointestinal problems, headaches, um, hand tremors. Sometimes people will, will feel that. Um, again, you're, you're being flooded with cortisol. People will begin over time to engage sometimes in risky behaviors. And that can include um, sexual behaviors, risk taking, uh, drug and alcohol, and sometimes around about four months, sometimes we see an increase in suicide. Everyone has some reaction. That does not mean that it is not um, outside the norm. So we say that these are normal uh, reactions to an abnormal situation, or it could be common reactions to an uncommon situation. So part of what we do is help people understand that. So psychological first aid is uh, a way to help do that. So um, psychological first aid is a uh, approach to working with um, people who have been impacted by a disaster or a traumatic event. And um, you may have heard in the past uh, and st still to some extent, uh, critical incident stress debriefing. A lot of people were trained in that. That was uh, originally designed for first responders and uh, continues to be favored in that in those communities uh, and organizations. Um, what the research did find is that sometimes critical incident stress debriefing, which is a very formal uh, procedural uh, approach to debriefing um, did not, over the long term, reduce uh, um, the onset of post-traumatic stress disorder and in some ways actually created more, more exposure to trauma, kind of secondary exposure um, to, to individuals who may not have been firsthand uh, witnesses to some events. So psychological first aid was developed. It is currently um, endorsed by the World Health Organization and is also used by the Red Cross. And so it's, again, designed to reduce the initial distress caused by traumatic events and to foster short and long-term adaptive functioning. One of the nice things about psychological first aid, it is so adaptable. So you can adapt it to um, age groups, to developmental levels, to um, different cultures. You can use it in a group setting uh, with families and communities. So it is very, um, flexible in that sense. And it's also very flexible in the sense that um, you do not have to be highly trained to be able to do psychological first aid. Uh, it does require some training and those links at the bottom uh, of your screen are online trainings uh, for free that you can do uh, to complete that training. But psychological first aid was really designed for neighbors, for church members, for non-mental health folks. Um, to help each other and to help uh, the people in the areas that they're responding to. So it, uh, I mentioned this a minute ago, so this is applicable to all these um, methods or groups. Um, and then here are some of the core actions related to that. So and this, this is basically it. There are eight core actions related to psychological first aid. And this is uh, making contact and engaging. And I'll tell you right now that this is the hardest one. Number one is, is very much the hardest one. And I'll tell you a story. So um, I did train uh, it, when we, we had the floods in Indiana that I referred to uh, a little while ago. Um, I was responsible uh, for melding, basically, um, collaborating between our mental health center and the Red Cross to uh, respond. And so I did put, uh, put together my mental health team. We did have a family service area where people could go, uh, kind of a one-stop, if you've heard of that, where people are, uh, can go and get their licenses. They can file their insurance claims. They can um, do a variety of different things, you know, uh, file with FEMA, things like that. And I uh, asked my mental health folks to go down there and, and do some psychological first aid uh, and that I would be there later, a little later in the, in the morning. So when I got down there, they were down there and they had set up a table in the one stop uh, and they had a big sign that said mental health. 
and they were all behind the table and everybody else was out in uh, sitting in chairs or, or waiting in lines and doing uh, whatever it is that they were doing, waiting to, to get assistance. And so I asked them, what, uh, my staff, what, what are you doing back here? And they said, well, no one's coming up to talk to us. And uh, I said, well, yes, because who would want to come up uh, when you're already feeling overwhelmed and stressed out to the table that says mental health, where you are all hiding behind. Um, and so this, <laughs> this is a good example of why mental health folks sometimes don't make the best responders in terms of psychological first aid. We're, we're used to a, a, a fairly formalized approach. This is really about just going out and talking to people. So I sent them out to ask people if they wanted water, to sit next to somebody and just introduce themselves and have a conversation. And suddenly they were having those conversations. So it's really just about introducing yourself and asking somebody about, hey, what's going on? Um, helping provide safety and comfort. So, you know, what we're talking about is um, people can't talk to you. They can't process things if they don't feel safe in that moment. Do they need a, a drink of water? Do they need some food? Do, uh, do, do they need to go to the bathroom? And if you could just stand in line for them, then uh, they could attend to that. Um, just some of that basic kinds of stuff. And then down through the different steps of just um, assisting in stabilization, helping identify who, who needs more assistance, who just needs somebody to talk to for a minute, helping gather uh, appropriate and, and um, accurate information so after disaster, when people are very stressed, they're very concerned, they're, um, they're afraid. The, remember, their sense of safety has been stripped away. Uh, they want information. And if there's no information, we as human beings tend to make up information. Uh, if they're called rumors. And uh, we're really good at it. And they rarely are very positive. So providing accurate information or searching that out is, is very helpful. Offering practical assistance reconnecting people to their social supports, helping them uh, remember how they've dealt with stressful situations in the past and uh, linking them with anything else that they need. Those are basically the, the core um, actions of psychological first aid. So what, uh, what does that mean for you? It means that you're gonna listen to someone. <laughs> That, that you are going to be with someone. We're in a society, we live in a society where people um, feel like if we're not doing something, if we don't have something to show for what we did, then it's not real. And what we forget is that one of the most powerful things that we can do is take time to give someone our attention and to just really listen uh, to what they have to say. And it's not about what we want to hear. It's about what it is, what is the story that they want to tell? And it's being respectful about that and listening. And we know that uh, from the research that allowing people to tell their story in their own time, in their own way, uh, allows them to take those emotions and those thoughts that feel very disconnected uh, in their body and in their experience and start to find a place for those uh, that makes sense to them. And, and lots of times we won't see that or know that. kids do this inherently. They're very natural at it. If a child experiences a, 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 an event that stresses them out or that scares them, what you often hear is over and over and over again that same story over and over. And actually parents and adults tend to get very frustrated with this, like drop it already or you know, just move on to a different topic. Um, but they naturally know that this is the way of processing. They play They'll tell the story. We, I had kids in the waiting room after 9-11 that were building the towers and, and airplanes out of Legos and repeating, repeatedly crashing them. And the, the adults in the building were, were very upset with this uh, until we reminded them that this is how, this is how kids tell their story. Uh, they do it through play. This is not therapy. Uh, this is simply being there with someone. Uh, and being there also means that we're sensitive to different aspects of diversity. So um, in Haiti, we were able to use psychological first aid uh, because we were listening. We weren't telling, uh, we were providing some information, but we were letting people tell their story. And so because psychological first aid is so adaptable, um, 
it really does not, it, it, there's nothing about it that you're imposing um, your own beliefs, your own culture, your own religion onto someone else. So what do survivors and responders uh, need? First is to feel safe and secure. Without that, we're, I mean, we're just not going to move forward. Um, to be able to have their basic needs met, and then to be able to tell their story, uh, because that that is <laughs> their way of making sense. And again, this is uh, trauma is a process, and so is um, reacting and healing from trauma. It's a process. It is not an event. To reconnect with coping skills, because again, that's the first thing that we forget in a crisis is how we've been successful in the past, because we feel so overwhelmed in that moment. Um, so asking people questions about um, ways that they've dealt with things in the past or, or things that they've overcome can sometimes help them uh, regain that, that sense of purpose and strength or to remember, yeah, you know, you're right. I, I have handled some really incredible things in my life uh, and I can get the, through this as well. Uh, so the guiding principles of psychological first aid. So we're creating an environment. Remember, we're not, we're not doing so much as being. So we're being calm. We're helping people stay safe or feel safe. Um, we're connecting. And, we're, and human beings, are, are we are social. We are built socially. We learn socially. We experience socially. Um, Self-efficacy, which is basically uh, that sense of that I can and will do it. Um, and that is is built on past successes and reminders of those past success successes. Um, we're empowering and, and helping people have hope. And you know, I, I very early on, one of my professors said, if you do nothing else, when you meet someone for the first time for a session, it, at least at the very least, give help them have a sense of hope. Because if we do not have hope, um, there is no purpose in moving forward. We don't believe that it's going to get better. I mentioned earlier that some of the things that, um, some of the reactions that people have um, include uh, some cognitive distortion, right? So really having um, memory impacted. And people, people get really concerned about this. It's like, you can have a con and, and people and uh, and responders get very frustrated with this. So you may be working with someone who has uh, been there for for some time, or maybe been directly impacted, and you uh, have given you know you've had a conversation and you need to do something, or you have a you have a set of um, steps that need to be um, done in order. It would be very common for someone to uh, that has been impacted by a disaster to have uh, to, to not be able to remember that or to not be able to follow multi-step um, instructions to not remember acronyms okay so we use as clear language as possible we are very direct short short simple sentences short instructions um, patience a lot of patience i sat there with an individual and this was a therapist down in Gulfport, and uh, she she was a therapist in the community. She was directly impacted, um, and she was drinking. Uh, you know, at that point in time, Walmart had back had opened, um, the liquor stores had reopened, and uh, she she was drinking about a bottle of wine uh, a night. And and so I, in my um, in my own mind, of course, did this brilliant intervention and and, and talked to her about that and. You know, reminded her about um, what she worked with with other people. You know, prior to the disaster about alcohol abuse and things like that. And so I thought we had this great conversation. And then at the end of it, um, she said, "Now tell me again why I shouldn't drink." I mean, so it was like that. That whole conversation didn't happen. I thought that we were having this great moment, and I was being really effective. In reality, I I missed being with her. Okay. I miss, I was telling, I was doing, I wasn't listening. Um, as human beings, we frequently um, don't want to engage because we don't know what to say. 
Uh, and then when we do engage and we feel uncomfortable, we have a tendency to say some things that, that aren't that great. Uh, and so this is just kind of a list of, um, of things that, that people commonly say that, uh, that we suggest that you don't. <laughs> because it, it's for the person on the receiving end, it can feel like a platitude, um, like you're not really validating how they feel. So it's really more about just listening. And, uh, you know, it's perfectly okay to say, like, I, I just don't know what that would be like, or I, I can't imagine what that was like for you. Um, it's, it's, uh, but telling, telling someone that um, it will all be okay, um, or I know exactly how you feel. Well, we don't, and we don't know it's going to be all okay. I don't know how that person feels because I'm not them. So this is just a little note in here to be, be careful of what we say. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about self-care for responders because, um, as I noted earlier, um, as responders, you are also survivors and subject to all of those same um, reactions that, that we described before for someone who is actually, um, has, was actually direct, directly impacted. So in addition, um, responders have some some uh, other things that we do to ourselves, which is that we have a little, sometimes have a little sense of grandiosity, and it is really difficult um, to not help or to feel like you like it's okay to leave because it's not done, um, or to take that moment for self care uh, because there's so much that needs to be done. And uh, the bottom line is that if you choose to respond, please um, have evaluate done a self-evaluation are you in a position that you feel like you emotionally physically financially can do this uh, because uh, okay here's a good example so here is some uh, I, I responded to 9-11 and I'm uh, showing up to check in and uh, here's a woman who just had a hip replacement uh, and she is there to respond she cannot carry her own baggage or luggage. She cannot, she's very limited in her activities. We have spontaneous responders, right, uh, that show up. Uh, this happened in, in uh, Hurricane Katrina. People showed up and said, uh, oh, hey, so can we join your camp? Or uh, do you have a place I can stay? Or, or do you guys have supplies? Be aware of where you are, <laughs> emotionally, physically, financially, like I said. Because um, if you are unaware and you go, you may very well become a drain on those resources as opposed to an assistance. And I don't think anybody uh, intends for that to happen. So have a plan, have, have identified resources, um, have these discussions and, and this awareness beforehand. Know what is going on. Don't, please don't avoid uh, meetings or uh, information that is going to be valuable to you. Be open to the fact that other people may notice that you're not um, firing on all cylinders, for lack of a better term, right? You may be stressed out. You may be experiencing some of those reactions. Um, be open to, to the idea that uh, someone may be able to give you feedback about that because as a responder in the middle of it, that and experiencing it, I'm not the best uh, person to be objectively identifying what's going on with me, all right? I'm in the middle of it. I need to be able to eat, drink, get my exercise. I need to maintain my connections. Uh, I need to be social, but I also need to take time for myself. And that, you know, that the amounts of that vary per person. Um, if, when I am looking for team members, um, I will always say that the first thing I'm looking for is flexibility because it will never go the way you expect. It is very, very likely to, that you want to get there and you want to help and you get there and you end up sitting on your hands for an extended period of time because that's what happens in disasters. Um, the information is coming in, the decisions need to be made, and the deployments uh, need to be decided upon. And and sometimes we just have to wait for that. And to be frustrated or angry um, is 
is uh, not helpful and actually is exacerbating that situation. When you come back, again, uh, this is a time to, uh, to take care of yourself. You want to participate in the debriefing because that is also helping you to um, be aware of what's going on. Um, to put those things, those feelings, those emotions um, into a place that makes sense for you. To recognize that while you were gone, other people's lives went on and they have feelings about that too. Um, it's, we like to say uh, to, to responders, give someone permission to give you feedback when you come back on, on how they, they see you functioning, how they see you doing. Do not make it a spouse or a partner because then there's other dynamics that, uh, that get involved in that. And make the agreement that they can come and tell you, um, give you feedback or express concern. You don't have to agree with it. You just have to consider it. All right. And you'll be amazed um, that you may be acting or being in a manner different than, uh, than you think you are. But that honesty and that openness can help you get back to where you want. Uh, to be. These are common stress reactions in responders. Um, again, you'll notice that these are uh, some of the same uh, reactions that uh, occur in people that um, were directly impacted. So just to summarize, because we are uh, at time basically, um, psychological first aid, and again the links there are at the bottom of the screen. Uh, for, to uh, do some online training. It doesn't take uh, a very long time, and it, actually it's very good training. You can, um, there's vignettes, and it's very interactive. I've done it. it I, I've actually enjoyed it, so I highly encourage you to do that. This is uh, a method to help people deal with um, the results of uh, disasters and traumatic events. It's also a method of helping responders uh, deal with the, uh, the effects and aftermaths of aftermath of responding to those events. So um, I hope this was helpful to you and I highly encourage you to Great. Well, thank you so much, Jody. Go online and explore that if you haven't already. Some of you may already be trained really helpful information. And um, before so we jump over to the questions, because there's been a few that have come in so far, to, uh, I realized I neglected at the beginning of the presentation to ask a poll question that we wanted to um, field with this group. And I know that many of you were involved with response to Hurricane Harvey, but um, just to kind of get some conversation going, if you all could just quickly answer this question, if you've ever been involved with responding to a large-scale disaster. So whether it be Harvey or any other storms uh, prior to that or any other regions that you lived in where you had responded, just helpful to get a sense of um, who had some of these first-hand and for those of you who did, I encourage you to uh, draw on those experiences and thinking about your own psychological state and uh, if you have any questions relating to this program that you can share with the group. OK, so Jody, I'm sure you're seeing this too. It's about 50-50 with this, uh, which is really incredible. Yeah. So, um, well, let's go ahead. Uh, turn over to the questions. So the first one we have was from Jennifer, who was wondering how we yeah. as responders can yeah. help inspire That's hopefulness. Awesome. I shouldn't say that things will be better. How do you walk that line, Jody? Ah, that's a great question, Jennifer. Thanks for that. So, um, I want to make sure I answer this appropriately. So, um, the difference is really um, in in what we're saying or how we're saying it. So, when we just say, "Oh, you know what? It'll all get better," um, that statement in and of itself is really not all that helpful because people aren't feeling. Um, like all of a sudden it's going to get better. 
uh, there and when we say that and it oftentimes doesn't resonate with what their current experience is so they kind of cast it aside like you don't understand me you don't understand what's going on and so then we've lost that connection with them uh, on the other hand I mean I really like that question because we do want to inspire helpfulness or hopefulness so um, helping people understand that um, what they're going what they're finding is a new normal okay it is it, it isn't not what they experience up to this point that things are different that, that validating of how people are feeling um, is is really important because that that's what that's what really impacts that connection. Uh, helping people remember um, things in the past that they've successfully overcome um, helping them understand that what they're experiencing is not a bad thing. It's, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with them. It doesn't mean that, that's something, that they're going crazy. Because that's what people oftentimes think. It's like, if I'm experiencing this, like, I, I can't remember things. I can't, um, I can't follow simple directions. There's something really wrong with me. Uh, and if they don't talk about it, then they get more anxious about it. And then that, that makes it worse. So... That sense of hopefulness can really come from um, normalizing those responses Great. to helping them Wonderful understand. Wonderful answer, yeah, Jennifer yes, just chimed yes, in of course. Saying, Thank um, you for that response, Judy. Things are going to be different. Um, then we had how, another how question from Mary Beth uh, who's who wondering can, about, who um, reconnect with early on in your remarks, you talked about the importance of keeping cash. And she's wondering where you where you keep that, if anything could potentially be destroyed, your, your car, your house, your office. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, <laughs> that's a really good question, too. So uh, there's there's two different answers to that. So one is I encourage everyone I know, all my friends and colleagues, to carry um, $40 in their car. And I can't tell you how many people have just said, you know, I, I left the house, I didn't have my wallet, I ran out of gas, <laughs> and, and I'm so glad I had that $40. So just on a day-to-day -day basis, I just really encourage people to do that. Um, what I typically do is I, I have a, a, a fireproof safe and I make um, some money in that. It, it, uh, now, you can't, you know, I, I can't guarantee, right, that, 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 that I'll be able to recover it. Uh, people do a variety of different things. If, if you have time to prepare for a disaster and you know it's coming, you can uh, always uh, keep that on you in, right. in some yeah. manner. And Melissa uh, had but chimed in. But at least saying, have that uh, resource. Maybe you can get so one of those travel have, money belts um, to wear underneath your clothes. So I think that might be some of that um, a helpful idea. It doesn't have to have be some a lot. Advance notice, uh, but just, just so that you know you have buy. things like your your cash, your IDs on hand. Uh, and it's harder to lose than anything else. Um, mm -hmm. So, oh, and Mary Beth just chimed in saying she does have a small safe at home with birth Absolutely. certificates. So that's, that's, that's a good thought. Um, mm -hmm. Great. So then there was also just a question um, about Absolutely. whether or not we could have the PowerPoint slides uh, from Mary Beth as well. So I'll just tell you, Mary Beth, we Great. will make exactly. the recording available for anyone who is interested in seeing the presentation again. Um, and we'll uh, also be sharing the links on a web page, too, so that you can always access the recording and the links. Great. Did anyone have any other questions related to the content? I will say that you know this is very helpful information for you all because um, although you may be responding to an event outside of your your home area, um, you know for example, you could be based in Austin and go help in Houston or um, vice versa across the state. It is really important to think about what might happen if the event is in your own home area and how dealing with the disaster on a personal level will affect your ability to respond. So just thinking about checking in on yourself and checking in on your fellow responders too and just keeping in mind some of the signs that uh, Jody has let you all know about will be, I think, key for working effectively as a team. 
And also I just want to emphasize to um, Jody mentioned towards the end of her remarks about in selecting teams that flexibility is key and that's what we've really found in working with uh, the National Heritage Responders team and, and anyone else who's been involved with working in this field. Just recognizing that in yourself it's not going to be an ideal situation so you have to be able to be the most flexible version of yourself in order to to effectively work in these kinds of environments. So thank you for bringing that point up, Jody. Okay, well I'm not seeing any other new questions coming in. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and move this back over again, the schedule of all of the upcoming presentations. A reminder that this will um, be available on the website that I shared with you all previously um, that has all of the information about the self-study portion of your training, which I can share in the chat window again momentarily. But uh, our next program is going to be on March 7th. We had that um, up in the air when I first emailed about the series. Uh, so it has been scheduled for the 7th, so just in a few short weeks, uh, on a broader topic of health and safety issues in, in a disaster situation. So. Um, keep an eye out for the invitation for that program. And then I also wanted to share with you all uh, the risk of blocking the, <laughs> the upcoming schedule. Um, let's see if we can put it up here. Uh, just a quick link to a survey for this webinar. It's very helpful for us to have information about um, your feedback on this program. So it should take less than five minutes if you're able to just um, again, use this box as the web links box below, so just click on the, the text in blue and click on Browse to, and that should take you to the survey. So Jody, is there any other closing remarks that you wanted to make before we wrap up the session? Uh, just a thank you. I really, I really enjoy talking about this topic, and um, and I love that people are so interested uh, in responding and and understanding the the psychological dynamics of that. Um, and just uh, just the last reminder that um, you know if, to take care of yourself. That self care is really uh, really important here because if you're going to be an asset to your team and um, able to really assist. Uh, as well as well, come well, thank back you so much, uh, Jody. successfully and, and so reintegrated for, uh, through the challenges of getting back.